two slides. All right. Welcome, 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 guys. My name is Mary Lynch. So we, most of us communicated in some way, shape, or form over this or over the last couple of lectures. So this is the third in our lecture series, our wellness series. So we've done back, we've done feet, and now shoulders. So I don't know what body part is next, but there's about to be another one that we need to discuss. Uh, so I'll let these guys introduce themselves. We are recording this. So I will share the link with you afterward in case you didn't pay full attention or, you know, whatever happened along the way, or you wanted to get a repeat on that. Um, but enjoy the evening, as well as we are looking to continue this in May and possibly June. So we're always open to topics. So if there's something that you're like, hey, something we're talking about, you know, let me know, email me or whatever. We'll probably take at least July and August off, and then we'll regroup again for the fall. So we like you guys have been great with your response to all this, and we would love to keep this ball rolling, our education level high. So enjoy the night. Thank you. Thank enjoy you. the hour, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> so, good, good late afternoon, early evening, everybody. Um, I was last year, like I said, three years ago, giving a similar talk, uh, and then I would have done so the following year, but COVID. And then COVID, one, two, and now, thankfully, we are here back. Um, so, my name is Josh Pleka. I'm an orthopedic upper extremity surgeon. Um, I specialize in problems of the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, and the hand. And uh, between Ross and I, Ross is a physical therapist. He's going to be giving that talk following mine. Um, we're going to be talking about shoulder injury and prevention in 2022, since it's 2022. And so a little bit about me. I grew up in Brookline, just uh, not too far from here. I played tennis in high school and college. Um, I'm a family guy. Now, literally, my life is driving to the <laughs> That's Most of you, I'm sure, know that uh, and have lived it. So um, clinically, uh, I you know, went to school a lot to be where I am. And um, was in upstate New York for undergrad and then went to Georgetown in medical school. Um, I always say, people tell me to say that I was first in my class because I was first in my class. Uh, but so was everyone else at every other medical school in the country. Uh, and that happens every single day. So there's a bunch of firsts in my class. But I was the one for my, uh, I did my orthopedic training in upstate New York, Indiana, University of Rochester, which was the busiest fracture hospital in New York State. So it was a very busy five-year experience. And then I did my upper extremity fellowship in Baltimore uh, at the Curtis National Hand Center. Um, and we did both uh, complex hand, complex shoulder, elbow. Uh, and we were the designated um, trauma center for hand trauma for Congress. So that was cool and very uh, rewarding experience. Um, after that, I was in practice for seven years in upstate New York at uh, SUNY Upstate in Syracuse. And um, I became chief orthopedics at the community hospital there, and I was an assistant professor. And then I moved here, which was about five years ago. And so that's me. Um, there should be no questions about that. So what we're going to talk about today, just an overview, is what is the problem with shoulders and tennis specifically, and what are expectations, and a little bit about tennis and how you're supposed to hit the ball and hit a serve and what the kinetic chain is, a little bit about the anatomy and pathology that we see in shoulders, because most people don't know what the different parts of the shoulder are. And uh, then we'll talk about the medical evaluation of shoulder problems, surgery and surgical options for different problems, and then uh, generally expectations thereafter. So the problem, we want to be the guy on the left, <laughs> but we invariably are the guy on the right. Male, female, doesn't matter. We're all getting older. We have limited time. We all like to compete and have fun, enjoy ourselves, exercise, and we really don't like getting hurt. And I, I subscribe to that. I've updated this slide to be more uh, timely, you know, with young American players and Carlos Alcaraz, and, uh, Taylor Fritz, and Tsitsipas, and Seb Korda, uh, you know, showing the different strokes that we all aspire to hit. Um, I did not intentionally leave any female players out of this before Ms. Naomi Osaka. She's obviously fantastic as well. Um, so that's what we expect out of our tennis. And what we tend to forget is that most of our lives are spent doing this. This is the reality of how we live. Like the guy on the top left, we're sitting crouched in front of a computer or a device, spending lots of time hunched forward uh, with heads sloping forward. You may remember a parent telling you, stand up straight when you were a kid or a teenager. And um, invariably, we would ignore them. Uh, 
we all want to work out, but it's it's a slog. And I applaud all of you for being members here and working hard to be the best person you can be. Um, so in terms of tennis specifically, when we think about shoulders, the important thing to understand is that your shoulder is only two parts of the kinetic chain in uh, a service motion or a ground stroke motion. And so when we actually break it down into its different parts, of which there are seven, it's leg drive, which is not the shoulder. It's trunk rotation, which is not your shoulder. It is arm elevation, which is your shoulder. It's elbow extension, which is your elbow. Your shoulder then internally rotates here. Uh, then you pronate your forearm, which is not your shoulder, and then you flex your wrist. So that's a serve motion. And there's a similar type of kinetic change. In the forehand, same thing, weight transfer, moving through your body. But your arm is not supposed to do the majority of the work. Your body is. We tell this to pitchers all the time, uh, kids who want to throw harder or hit harder or what, whack the ball or, or smack the ball, whatever it is. Um, they all try and use their arm, always. That's where they think their power comes from. Your arm is a little itty bitty scrawny puny thing and your trunk, your core, your hips, your legs are significantly stronger. And so if you use them properly, you tend to protect your arm uh, and not injure it as readily. When we look at the shoulder, the shoulder, who knows what the shoulder is? It's a body part. What is it? What is it? Joint. Right, it's a joint. What's a joint? Bones coming together. Two or three. But yes, exactly. So most people think, I broke my shoulder, I broke my wrist. You didn't break your wrist or break your shoulder because those are joints. It's a space between the bones. But usually when we say that, we're talking about the bones that live very close to where that joint space is. And so a shoulder is made up of three bones, one of which is called the humerus, which is the arm bone and its upper part of the shoulder. Right? There is the shoulder socket, which is a part of the scapula or shoulder blade. And uh, then there is the thigh, which is part of what's called the acromioclavicular joint, which is a part of the shoulder blade and where it meets the collarbone. So there are really two joints in the shoulder. And um, they are made up of these bones. And that's an x-ray of it on the top left. That's a drawing of it here. And an arthroscopic intraoperative image of the inside of the shoulder. Uh, the top left is cartilage. Uh, the bottom part is ligament and sort of some frayed tissue. That's the ball and the socket and uh, a tendon there uh, in white. But we'll see that as well. um, when we think about the soft tissues of the shoulder, specifically the muscles, we always think about the rotator cuff. Everybody says any shoulder injury, it's always the rotator cuff. Go to the primary doctor, your shoulder hurts, it's your rotator cuff. It's not always your rotator cuff, um, but it is frequently. So they're not wrong most of the time, they just, they're just getting lucky. Um, there are four muscles that make up the rotator cuff. It is a cuff of muscles that surrounds and envelops the humeral head. There is one muscle in the front called the subscapularis, and that is responsible for internal rotation and that. There are two on the top called the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, which are this one here, and there's one uh, behind it, uh, this one here. Uh, this is a back view, that's a front view. And then there is a fourth muscle called the teres minor, which is, comes underneath here and attaches to the back of the human head. And amongst the four of them, they envelop it, envelop it completely. And the purpose and function of these four muscles is limited in terms of actually acting. Like, it, you know, they, they, they don't do a lot. They don't raise your arm. They do help externally rotate, meaning turn your arm out to the side. They do help to some degree reach behind your back, but they are not really primarily involved with raising your arm at all. Their job is to stabilize and center that ball in the socket and keep it centered so that it moves smoothly through an arc of motion and doesn't sort of slide around. Because the ball and socket, when you look at them, the bones and the cartilage, uh, it's really like a ball sitting on a plate. And you can imagine putting a ball on a plate, it would just roll around. And so these muscles help stabilize that ball and keep it centered as we move the arm. And that's where problems uh, tend to develop. There are also other structures other than the muscles and tendons which stabilize what they call ligaments. And those ligaments are involved in stabilizing the shoulder socket as well. They include things called the labrum and then thickenings of the joint lining that are called the glenohumeral ligaments. And there are three of them, superior, middle, and inferior. And they are all designed to help keep that ball centered. And so you can injure the labrum, you can injure the ligaments, you can do 
injure the muscles and tendons, you can injure the cartilage, you can injure the bone, uh, you can injure any number of these things. And we'll talk about a couple of different ways that these things can occur. So how do, in a normal person who picks up a back and says, I want to play football, they don't fall down or overextend themselves in any serious way, how do they get to the point where they have an injury? And usually, it is a complex, chronic process, not slowly, so you don't necessarily realize that it's happening while it does. And so there are these dynamic stabilizers, the muscles, they become weak for one reason or another, through lack of use in action or posture. There are a variety of factors that lead to that. The static stabilizers, which are the ligaments and the labrum, they sort of step up to keep the ball centered since the tendons and muscles aren't really doing their job well, and they see additional stress as a result. So that leads to micro tears in the ligaments, in the labrum, and that leads to a reaction where the body sees those tears and tightens up and sort of makes it more brittle and tries to prevent the shoulder from moving the way it has been. And that's when those same attempts at action lead to larger tears and dysfunction. And that usually happens in the back of the shoulder joint, which is why many overhead athletes, tennis players, volleyball players, baseball throwers, swimmers, they have very significant external rotation of the arm. Uh, you can imagine a baseball pitcher. Sometimes you see the pictures of them and their forearms are per parallel to the ground. They go all the way back. That's called external rotation. But when you try and get them to bring their hand down like this, their arm stops around here. And that's called glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. And that leads to a shift in the way the ball and socket interact, leading to injuries to parts of that shoulder socket and the structures around it. How common is this? Uh, it's pretty common. How many people in here? 25, something like that? There's, yes? Did you have a question? You were just raising your hand. <laughs> right. So <laughs> look to your left, look to your right. Um, you and one of the other people is going to have shoulder pain at some point in your life. It's two out of three. So, you know, in every row, at least two of you on average are expected to have shoulder pain at some point. And there are different kinds of shoulder problems that develop in younger patients. They tend to be traumatic injuries, specific events. But as you get older, over the age of 35, which is not that old, but it's old enough, um, things start to, if you haven't injured yourself earlier, they start to become more degenerative. Chronic problems that sort of snowball over time, but don't give you the same kind of warning like a traumatic injury would. Like you slip and fall and twist your ankle. You're like, oh, I sprained my ankle. Whereas if you chronically injure your ankle on a very low level where it doesn't tell you, um, and then one day it does, you're like, oh, it must have just happened. And you can't really explain when or where something happened. And that's how it goes. Um, injuries in tennis players uh, happen, and I mean injuries that lead to treatment, uh, about... 10 to 15% of the time. Um, the common types of pathologies we see are what's called shoulder impingement. Uh, we see instability, rotator cuff inflammation or tears, injuries to the labrum and biceps, which attaches to the labrum, and then what's called scapular dyskinesis. Scapular dyskinesis just means that the shoulder blade, which is supposed to move in a specific way, isn't moving in the right way. And it's usually a result of muscle imbalances that lead to it for walking with a funny walk. In the case of the shoulder blade, with a funny walk. So what are the things that lead to us developing these kinds of shoulder problems? And really, um, the conditioning. Weekend warriors, we're busy. Most of our lives are not geared towards tennis. They're geared towards jobs, life, other things. And so we're starting off if we pick up tennis later in life um, or we're not really regimented and adamant about how, and vigilant about how we go about taking care of our bodies, um, we tend to be deconditioned. So the rotator cuff is at risk for injury. Um, we have a lot of very strong muscles that pull our arms inward, our pectoralis major, our latissimus, um, these muscles pull in with force. And so they're stronger than these little deconditioned muscles and they put additional stress on them. These little muscles that bring our arms out, which are part of the rotator cuff, are small. And they're relatively weak compared to these other big muscles that are acting on our arm. And like I mentioned, this GERD, G-I-R-D, that's the sclenohumeral internal rotation deficit, where our shoulder just gets 
stiff and doesn't want to get into this position. So it lives in a spot that could that risk for injury. Uh, for injury. Um, and then for use of the kinetic chain. So people who hit with their arm. You know, I see people, I see lots of 3035 and TRP rated players playing doubles, and literally they stand there and it's this. They don't turn their body at all to swing. It's, I don't know if anyone's seen that. Yeah, there's room for improvement. Um, so these are the things that lead to these problems developing. So when I evaluate a patient who has shoulder pain, uh, there's usually, I split people into two groups based on age. So there's younger patients, and they frequently have traumatic injuries that we talked about, um, ligamentous or labral injuries, uh, instability of their joint, uh, you know, or if they fall, they can have uh, uh, what's called shoulder separation, which is an joint instability. Um, they can break things, fall. And, 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 uh, I had a young kid who uh, pulled off a piece of uh, the attachment of a substandard arch, 15. Yeah. And it was on a trampoline. Um, uh, they can develop, but at the same time, they can develop these same kinds of chronic problems, usually because they're playing at a higher level, playing higher, faster, more. And so their bodies, you know, have to be put through a lot. And so they can develop tendonitis. And, and sometimes when I see these patients, it's actually not a problem with their shoulder at all. It's actually their neck. And their neck radiates symptoms of nerve irritation down sometimes the shoulder, but it can also go all the way down into the hand. And frequently, the questions we ask are, do you have numbness and tingling, the radiates down the arm, any electrical sensations of burning? Because shoulder pathology rarely presents with symptoms that travel below the elbow. So if it goes from the shoulder all the way down into the hand, it's usually not the shoulder. Uh, in older patients, similar kinds of problems, chronic sort of tendonitis and impingements, uh, inflammation, you can develop tears in the rotator cuff of a more degenerative nature. Um, you can also tear the biceps long head, which goes into the shoulder joint. You can develop bursitis. Adhesive capsulitis is a condition commonly known as frozen shoulder, where your joint stiffens up for no reason that we can explain. It's more common in diabetics. You can develop arthritis as a function of aging. Some people are genetically predisposed to it. Again, cervical pathology, so similar uh, to younger groups. And also, uh, older patients can fall and break things. Happens all the time. They treat shoulder fractures very commonly. So when you talk about what do you see all that? What do I inquire of someone when they present to me, which is part of their history, is, okay, so where's your pain? Where does it hurt? How does it hurt? How would you describe it? How long has it been hurting? How long does it last? What makes it feel better? What makes it feel worse? Do you have pain at night that wakes you up from sleep or prevents you from sleeping? Do you have stiffness? Not just it hurts when I move it, but actually I can't move my arm that far even if I forced it, even if I tried to push it through the pain. And that's sort of the differential for frozen shoulder or arthritis. Do you have crunching in your shoulder, grinding, clunky <laughs> sounds that might indicate a mechanical component to your problem? And do you feel like your shoulder is slipping out? Does it feel like it's popping in and out of its socket? It's called uh, subluxing. It's a feeling of it, which is called apprehension. You feel like it's about to come out. Sort of like if you were standing on the edge of a cliff and you felt like you might fall over. And so that, that sort of fear and apprehension, that's a sensation people with instability get uh, right before the shoulder is about to pop out and they usually stop doing what they're doing. When I examine someone physically, I do all the same things that every doctor does when they go through an evaluation of a, of a particular system, a musculoskeletal system. It's, it starts with inspection, looking at things. And so I examine. Usually I have people take their shirts off. Uh, usually women are in tank tops or they put them down. Um, and we look to see, is there an asymmetry? Does one side look different than the other? Top left picture is a, a picture of someone with scapular winging, their shoulder blades sticking off of their back. It's pretty prominent. And looks completely different on the right than the left. And so if you don't look, you won't see. And so you may miss a diagnosis that's there and looking at you and you're not looking at it. Um, so you can see bony deformities, you know, people with old injuries, uh, prominence of certain joints, that are arthritic, abnormal contours, uh, atrophy of muscles, loss of muscle bulk or bulging. Uh, this picture on the right is, you see this big bump here? Uh, that is the biceps muscle. This is a proximal biceps rupture. And they, it's called a Popeye deformity, even though Popeye had really big forearms. <laughs> bastardized this and applied it to the arm. So this muscle sort of slingshots down the arm and gives this big lump. Uh, some people like it, many people don't. Uh, 
uh, and step of elimination. Again, like I mentioned. Uh, through a range of motion. I ask them to do it on their own. I then do it myself with my hands and move them without using any of their muscles actively. I ask them to reach behind their back and move their shoulder blades and see how these things move. These are all different motions that the uh, shoulder goes through. And uh, uh, it, is a, it is the most mobile joint in the body. It has the largest range of motion of any joint in the body. And that is a function of it being mostly made of soft tissues. The ball and plate, because it's so uh, unrestrained and can roll around, it allows us the freedom to put it wherever we want, which is really helpful because the function of the shoulder is to put the hand in space where you want it. Bring it to your face, put it behind your head, do your hair, get a tennis ball. So in an arthritic shoulder, I uh, have sort of a classic appearance. It's not exactly like rotator cuff tendinitis, but frequently people sent to me with that as a diagnosis. They usually can't get their arm out. They're there, and one side they go out like this, and the other side they're locked here, just won't go because the bones are sort of rubbing against each other. It tends to be crunching and grinding. There's a loss of the contour of the anterior of the front of the shoulder. Um, thankfully, hopefully, most of the make it hard. Um, when I examine the rotator cuff, this uh, is very helpful in diagnosing someone who has a rotator cuff tear of size. Because a small rotator cuff tear, uh, you, can you can mask it. it. You know, there's still tendon attached. It's only partly, maybe fully torn, but it doesn't have to be completely detached. It can have a hole in it, like a hole in the sock. And so uh, some people can't hold their arm up like this. Other people can't hold their arm up against resistance where it's significantly different than their other side. And there are different tests for the different muscles of the rotator cuff. And then to examine for things like impingement tendonitis, we do certain maneuvers to try and pinch the tendons between, between the bones or the bursa. And those are called near pockets maneuvers. Um, on their arm, you know, you can literally feel like it's almost pulling it out of its socket and your shoulder blade becomes very prominent and you can see it sort of stick out some salt at sun. So these are different things that we see and then we can push their arm around and see the, how much does the ball move? Does it slide almost out of the socket or does it actually dislocate and then go back? And so these are tests that we do to evaluate for that as well, all part of a standard orthopedic evaluation. Um, people, you, you saw all that stuff I just showed you? That gives you 95% of the information you need. Like people always come in and they're like, do I need an MRI? Like, sure, if you're gonna confirm something or plan surgery, but 95% of the time, the MRI CT scan is not required to make the diagnosis. So it is an adjunct. It's used liberally by primary care doctors who don't know and say, oh, your shoulder hurts, let's get an MRI. Because they don't know how to do these maneuvers effectively. But standard imaging tests associated with orthopedics are an X-ray. Uh, cancer tests with taxing, uh, with or without dye. Uh, ultrasounds can be part of evaluations if we're looking for uh, tumor cysts, uh, see if the biceps tendon is attached, or if the rotator cuff has been repaired and then re redetaches. And then MRI. MRI is generally the standard test that we do with someone with an advanced shoulder problem that isn't getting better with non-operative uh, treatment or one that doesn't uh, gives warning signs of uh, something significant. Um, so these are some of these conditions. If we look at uh, you know, shoulder, how does this present? Pain greater than three months, frozen shoulder, loss of motion, over 40, people who are diabetic and who have low thyroid. Um, this is what their joint looks like. This is a healthy looking joint. Their joint's red, inflamed. It's like it's been sucked. Um, patients present with overhead pain, serving in tennis specifically. Uh, they get a clicking sensation when they go to pronate their forearm and internally rotate their shoulder and they'll feel like a popping. And usually they can do ground strokes, but they can't hit serves. Um, I don't know if anyone has experienced that. Uh, sometimes these labral injuries are associated with a dislocation. The, the ball of the socket as it comes out of the shoulder joint will rip off the lining around it and damage it. 
sometimes that requires surgery. Um, these are just other exam findings, but I'm going to move along. Um, we diagnose labral tears after a physical exam to get us concerned for them um, with an MRI that we need to inject dye into the shoulder because it silhouettes the lining of the shoulder socket. And if there are fissures or tears uh, where the tissue otherwise is sitting exactly where it should be, but there's actually a tear in it, you won't see it unless you put some fluid in that will distend it and, and uh, elucidate the tear nice. This is an example of an MRI of this white fluid that's coming up into this space here uh, is not supposed to be there. This black triangular structure is supposed to be right against the bone and it's supposed to be white just straight down, sort of like how it is here. So this is a superior label. And frequently these can be treated non-operatively, but in some cases I, I uh, need surgery. I just operated on a young man. He is a um, college, uh, full scholarship, um, 18 years old. Uh, he, the last three months, has been doing therapy. Can't surf. He's on a tennis full ride to uh, college, and he's now got to redshirt his freshman year uh, because he has to recover from his labral surgery to reattach his superior labor. Um, look at a tough layout. It's incredibly common. Very rare in patients under 40 and less than traumatic. But the incidence of it increases steadily with age. Every 10 years, it increases by about 10 to 15 percent. If you're 80, you have probably about a 60 percent chance of having a full thickness rotator cuff tear, uh, and not even knowing it. A lot of people don't even know that they have these tears. Uh, what do we see uh, when someone is symptomatic, which is not always uh, pain? Usually, shoulder, front of the shoulder, side of the shoulder. A lot of times, at night, worse with overhead activities. Some people still have strength, other people don't. Some people present to me and they cannot raise their arm further than this. Other people can raise their arm fully, can move it through a full range of motion. There are differences between people. When you start to have weakness, it's usually associated with bigger tears. The smaller the tear, sort of like if you had a hole in your, uh, hole in your sock, a small hole in your sock, you can still wear it. But if it's really big and your whole foot's hanging out, um, then you, it's not really doing its job. What causes these tears? And, and this is something people always ask me: is Why? Why did? Why do I have a rotator cuff tear? I don't remember anything. And sometimes they're just degenerative. Why did you get a hole in the in your pants at the knee? You don't remember ripping it. It's not, you know, there had to be something that started before you put your toe in it and enlarged the hole. Um, but some people, it just happens. It's like, why does anything ever wear out? Why did my car break? Uh, we think that patients who perform a lot of repetitive activities, and everybody wants a reason. Why did this happen to me? Why me? Why now? Why this? And the answer is, is I don't know. Because I can't go back with you every single day of your life, categorize and inventory everything you've ever done, sum it all up and say for sure what it was that led to this. But generally speaking, repetitive overhead activity put people at greater risk for tears. Falls. Obviously, if you fall, and this tissue fails, that would be a very legitimate reason. So usually when that happens, people were fine. They have a fall. It's very obvious that something's wrong. They can't move their arm. And you examine them, and they show profound weakness in addition to pain. And you say, oh, I think you have a traumatic rotator cuff tear. Then usually you get an MRI, and, uh, and you frequently put those back together. As we increase in age, everything in our bodies becomes more brittle. It becomes more brittle because we're more brittle. That's just the way it is. Our tissue loses its elasticity. And so as you apply these sudden forces to it, it tends to lead to it tearing rather than elastically sort of distending and bouncing back. Does that make sense? Unfortunately. Right. So how do these things happen on a more clinical basis? So the, the, the main problem with rotator cuff tear starts in the front of the shoulder, which is a supraspinatus insertion. It's the leading edge, and usually it will start to peel up, and it starts to peel up, and then it starts to peel back. And once it starts to become, uh, from what this is called, a, a, a partial thickness tear, particular sided tear, it starts to peel up. And as it, it tends to peel off the front of the shoulder, like my finger is off with my hand here. And so it starts like this, and then as time goes on, it just sort of keeps going until it rips the whole thing off. Um, and that's something you may or may not feel. This, this is what it looks like arthroscopically. This is uh, an edge of the tendon, and it belongs over there. 
So, so this is a hole that you can see through, but everybody thinks of it like it's a sheet of paper. It's not, it's, it's a big flap of tissue, like a cuff. And so you can develop a hole in it. That's, that's not the entirety of the structure, but just a portion of it that you could stick your finger through like a hole at the heel of your sock, um, which is the easiest analogy to make. Um, and that's why I say it progresses from tendon to tendon, the large and the sock. Once you have a tear that's full thickness and all the way through, it cannot heal back to the bone on its own. The muscle is pulling on it. It's pulling the tendon away from the bony attachment. And there's fluid between the tendon and its attachment that prevents it from saying, I like being here. I'm going to migrate back to where I was. It's like uh, trying to, if you had a rubber band attached to something and you pulled it off, the rubber band on its own will not stretch itself back to where it was because the tendon is under tension. So it can't, once you release the tension, uh, return back to its original. Off. I explained that. Um, diagnosis to do it. X-ray is usually normal. Um, this is an MRI. This is the humeral head. This is the reverse image of this. This is the shoulder socket right here. This dark structure right here is the tendon of the supraspinatus. And this is the muscle here. Here gray coming to this black end right here. This end belongs over here. So this is a fully torn and retracted supraspinatus tear. And this is someone also with a massive tip. These are two different views. One is a front view, one is a top down view. The tendon is ripped completely off the bone up here. This is the end of the tendon, along here. Here, this is a tendon in the front called the subscapularis. It's correctly torn. This is, this is just showing that. That's, that's, that's not right. Um, that's actually the torn tendon. This is an intact tendon. So if you want a comparison, that tendon, you see the black here going into the muscle. This, this tendon, which is teres minor, comes all the way back and attaches to the bone the way it's supposed to be. So, how do we treat rotator cuff tears? And I'm going to give you some more. Um, Frequently, not everybody needs surgery. Anti inflammatory therapy can help a lot of people. Selective cortisone injections, it depends on the individual. So not every patient who has a rotator cuff tear has to have an operation. And in fact, most don't. If you are an overhead tennis playing athlete and you have a full thickness tear that has led you to be unable to play at the level and level of interest that you have, then that's an indication for surgery. But if you're just a putterer, if you don't spend a lot of time with your arm overhead, if you're not a tennis player, there are tons of people running around with rotator cuff tears that either don't know it or know it and don't care because it doesn't affect their life. But anti-inflammatories of various types. These are all the different brands that are available. What we know is that there are other things that can be used to treat different types of orthopedic problems, including um, hyaluronic acid injections, which are used in knees, uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, stem cells. They're, these have been studied extensively. There's no proof that they're better than anything else. There's no proof that they're better than nothing really expensive. Um, they sound great. They sound cool and technologically advanced. It, it is not borne out in the peer-reviewed clinical trial studies that these things are justifiably utilized. And that is why, for sure, they're not covered by insurance, uh, which it makes out of reach of many people. Now we put cameras in the joint. We're able to see. I'll show some pictures. This is the torn bicep tendon fibers. Um, this is inflamed tissue. And all of the things, when you go in arthroscopically to look inside your shoulder, you can evaluate and inventory all of the different structures and see whether what you see matches what you saw in the MRI, matches the complaints of the patient, and you can decide whether or not you need to treat them or not because not all things that are abnormal require treatment. All surgery now, most, most shoulder surgeons do all their surgery arthroscopically for these kinds of problems. You go in through teeny tiny incisions that are the width of my, between my fingers here, 
in the front, the side, and the back of the shoulder, and we can identify, trim, clean, repair. This is a big rotator cuff there. This belongs all over here. Uh, we can trim everything away, clean it up, and reattach it. It was first performed in the 90s, and over the last 30 years, it's been improved tremendously. We can do amazing things arthroscopically. Some people are trying to put in joint replacements arthroscopically, which is idiotic. But it's a thing. They're always trying to push the envelope. Um, yeah, we don't need that. How do I repair a rotator cuff? These are the kinds of implements that are used to repair tissue. Re, uh, re, repair tissue. There's an anchor that goes into the bone and then very thick, powerful stitches that are woven through the tendon and bring it back down to the bone to its attachment site and hold it in place while it heals. But it does need to heal. For examples of tears. This is a technique of repairing tears where you sew part of it back together side to side to make it smaller. And then you attach it back down to the bone. So these are schematics of a rotator cuff repair. In addition, arthroscopic surgery allows you to address other pathology, smoothing bone, removing collarbone parts, um, addressing the biceps tendon and arthritis if there is some, uh, but it's usually decided intraoperatively. So most surgeries can be done arthroscopically. Sometimes we need to make open incisions to address certain pathologies that can't be done arthroscopically, but that's rare. And usually that decision is made intraoperatively, but it's discussed with the patient in advance if there's a possibility that that is the case. So to summarize, shoulder can function without a rotator cuff. Not all of them though. There are three types of tears, traumatic, attritional, meaning just chronic, slow, progressive, degenerative, and then acute on chronic, meaning it's partly bad, and then you fall and make it worse. This is the most important thing about this slide and this talk. The severity of your pain is not an indication of the severity of your problem. Think about high blood pressure. How much does that hurt? <laughs> right, but it can kill you. Stroke, heart attack, Cancer doesn't hurt until it does, and then it's very bad. But lemon juice in your eye, not a bad problem, hurts a lot. So people always assume that the severity of their pain is an indication of the severity of their problem. It hurts so bad, it must be really bad. There's nothing to do with it. There are people who have pain, and there are people who don't. It is multifactorial and individual for that person. And you do not ascribe severity between one person and the other based on their pain. But what you do try and do is take a person from whatever pain they're in and make it better. You only compare them against themselves over time. It's around. Unfortunately, this slide is a video, which doesn't work. Or the video of it. This is a woman uh, fell while on a cruise and she tore all of the tendons of her rotator cuff. They're completely torn, completely detached. And the video shows her going like this. I say to her, does it hurt? She's like, oh yeah, it hurts. I'm like, does it hurt a lot? She's like, no, not a lot, but it hurts some. Um, but she's someone who functions extremely well. And the question is, why? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> but it has to do with the deltoid muscle. So there are natural differences in the deltoid muscle, which is the big muscle that moves the arm primarily. And we don't really know why some people can raise their arm and some people can't. I don't have the answer. I wish I could, because if I figured that out, I would be so rich. Wow. <laughs> um, I, I am, just for sake of time, going to skip over uh, the arthritic shoulder because that's not really super relevant. But this is what's called a stemless shoulder replacement. So even for tennis playing arthritic patients, there are solutions that let them get back to um, playing tennis, even with joint replacement, which sounds crazy. But think about um, uh, uh, Andy Murray, hip replacement. He's playing professional tennis. I don't know how long that will last, but he's doing it. So we're going to hold questions until after Ross gives his talk. My apologies. Thank you very much. Sorry for going out. I totally would too. Uh, I'm trying to pull your. Maybe I'll just like. No, uh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Just the space bar. So uh, I'll here. I'll just do this.
Well, yeah, but, but I mean, actually, that's that, coming up. Yeah, continue. That Just thinking. There you go. Lawyers, here, let me give you this. All right. Sorry. No, that's okay. Actually, you know what I should have? I'll keep, yep, yep. I'm just gonna. So I keep trying to There you go. Today. My name is Ross Allenbach. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I love that, that presentation for me. For, for some of you guys, you're probably looking at one of those pictures thinking, what am I looking at? That was really cool for me. I like that a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm a physical therapist. I've been with uh, Northeast Rehab. We have the clinic downstairs, right? Um, I've been with Northeast Rehab, Rehab since 2013, I think. Um, uh, bef before all of that, um, my undergraduate degree is in exercise physiology, so I got a degree in that, and then I took some time off, went back to school, got my doctorate in PT. Um, since then, I've done a lot of different things, okay? Working in long-term care, working in home care, working in outpatient, mostly outpatient now for the past since, uh, since I've been here. Um, and, and you'll notice that on the slide projector here, this is not me, someone who was supposed to do this talk, but at that now I'm here. <laughs> so this is actually uh, uh, her, her presentation, but I'm going to try to do it justice. Um, and yeah, so let's see. Shoulder injury prevention and rehab. Prevention. So I really liked a lot of the things uh, that Dr. Plicka was talking about at the beginning of his, of his talk about, you know, it's not all about just the shoulder, right? It's about uh, planting your foot. It's about the whole chain, right? Um, and we often forget that. And with a really, uh, with a thorough physical therapy assessment, let's say, for, for instance, you go to the, your PCP, your primary care physician, you say, I got shoulder pain. Oftentimes, um, you're going to get referred to us before him, okay? Um, and it was really interesting to see his presentation because that examination that he talked about with, you know, making the arm do this and this, it's all the same. It's the same examination that we would do okay um in addition to that when we find what we find and we determine that you're appropriate for you know to see us as for physical therapy before we consider sending you to the orthopedic surgeon for further assessment um we're also looking at not just the shoulder but your posture are you like this you know how good are you rotating how strong is your core uh, uh how's your leg strength can you do all the things you need to do and not completely rely on your arm. So all of that is what we're doing in, in, the, in our assessment, which is great. I like that he brought that up. Um, so you can see up here, uh, this is a prevention outline. Okay, so we're talking a little bit more about prevention, okay? Um, when we, if you look at the top, uh, how many tennis players are in here? A few, right? Um, and then just other people like doing other activities that you do, right? What's that? Swim. He's a swimmer. Okay, perfect. So with your activity, as with anything, um, I was a, 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 not a ball sport player. I played a little racquetball, which ruined my tennis game. <laughs> but, um, but I was uh, through college a runner, and we didn't ever just start a race, right? We didn't get it. You don't see, you don't go to a running race and everyone's at the, you see the start and everyone goes at the, at the gun. But if you hang around before that race, if any of you run, you'll know this, that before the race, people are kind of running up and down the field or on the road a little bit, doing some, then doing some stretching, and then they go to the, 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 the start of the race. So 
to prevent some of these injuries, to help prevent some of them. We know we can't prevent them all, but we want to do an active warm up, um, some stretching, right? Maybe before actually swinging that tennis racket or taking your strokes. Um, we want to think about your mechanics. We want to be strong. We got to talk about that core muscles, lower body musculature, posture. So let's say we are talking about shoulders or swimming. Before even swinging the racket or uh, jumping the pole and swimming, it might be a good idea to do something else, right? Some arm circles, uh, shoulder rolls. Um, maybe if you have the opportunity, jump on the elliptical trainer or some other machine just for a little bit to get warmed up. Okay. Afterwards, so first we do a little active warm up, right? And then we want to stretch before we get into our, our aggressive sporting activity. We might, we might do a, a horizontal abduction stretch. I think I have some pictures. Yeah, and Megan gave us a picture. So. so we have a stretch like this. Okay. We have stretches like this in the doorway. A lot of people, uh, Dr. Plekka mentioned it, spend all day in front of the computer or on the phone or whatever. And we're most, I see this all day long. Most of my patients that come in, are a little bit forward in the shoulders, if not very forward in the shoulders and the, 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 the top part of their spine. So even just doing a simple doorway stretch like that can just help bring you up in a better position. If you are very forward, okay, and when, since we're talking about tennis a little bit, if you come up, if you lift your arm and you're very forward, how far does your arm go? Not very far, but if you're up, I didn't move my shoulder joint. <laughs> All I did was fix my posture, right? So just doing some nice stretches to get your posture better helps. Stretching the triceps, the forearm, before actually doing your, your sport. Um, and one thing uh, Dr. Plug talked about was that tightness in the back of the shoulder that can often happen. This is a great stretch for that. We call it the sleeper stretch, okay? Just laying on your side, doing that. Okay. And other, other prevention things, um, if you have the opportunity working on your mechanics, uh, we actually see this really a lot in, in young kids. They want to throw as hard as they can or swing that tennis racket as hard as they can. So they have like excessive follow throughs. They don't have the, the control. Um, so if you have the opportunity to, you know, if there's some coaching uh, to, relevant to you if you're a sport that you could, you could do. And we do a little bit of that in therapy too. I'm not an expert in too many, all the sports, right? But we do know basic mechanics of a throw and um, maybe a, a swimming stroke. And we watch people run, we watch people throw balls, we watch people do their sport and see what we can pick out as something that is mechanically could be improved as well. Okay. And general fitness is huge. Uh, again, I go back to that. What Dr. Pleco was saying, we don't want to just be swinging the arm when we're playing our, our sport, right? The, the tennis. Um, but the reason that might be happening is maybe we don't have the power or the strength in the legs to get around, move around the court like we once did, right? Maybe we don't have the rotation in our spine that we, we had 20 years ago. Um, and maybe we just don't have the general strength and conditioning to support our support our bodies to, so that we could do these things, right? So just being generally fit and going to, into the gym and lifting the weights and maybe working with a trainer a little bit and, and making sure you're maximizing your general physical fitness is gonna help you big time in your uh, prevention of injury for your sport. Your activity that you wanna do, okay? These are all these examples of things. You get your squats, bridges, exercises that many of you are probably already doing out in the gym. I already talked about posture as one of the, we always evaluate that, especially with a shoulder um, evaluation. We're looking at posture, we're looking at uh, the neck as well, making sure everything is where it's supposed to be. All right, talking a little bit about rehab. So like Dr. Plekka said, uh, you might need surgery, you might not, right? Um, and everyone presents differently. and. I already talked about the um, examination a bit, just so you, just to kind of educate you a little. 
when you're coming in to see us potentially first, like I said, we're doing almost the exact same examination that 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 he is doing. Um, and once we and, and some of our tests are actually really like he said, 95% of the time you know what's going on, right? Just with your physical exam, which is pretty amazing to me. Um, for example, for labral tears, it's like three tests if you do them together and they're all positive. It's like 99% <laughs> uh, uh, effective in telling us what's wrong with that, that particular part of the shoulder. Um, so once we have figured out what we think is going on in your shoulder, we're going to try the therapy. We determine that the therapy is, is, is worth giving a shot. Um, then we will, we will start in, uh, in phases, okay? So usually uh, when people come and see us, something has happened, it's driven them to the doctor, and then it's, it's driven them to come see, see us. So usually this is more of the acute phase, things hurt, life's not good, right? And what we're trying to do in the beginning is just get your symptoms under control, right? Um, decrease uh, pain and inflammation. We might use ice, ease stem, things like that. Um, we might recommend that you hold off on certain activities you don't further irritate the tissues in there um, oftentimes the shoulder is not she said it earlier it kind of feels stiff and it's not moving right uh, so we're going to think about regaining uh, the range of motion in the shoulder early on a lot of stretching um, and if we do any strengthening it's going to be it might not be too much in the in the rotator cuff like you the smaller muscles depends on how irritated they are um, we might just be working more on that posture, those muscles that pull you back, pull your head back. Hopefully we've done our job and you're starting to feel better. So now we're kind of in the middle phase of rehab. We're going to progress your strengthening, continue. You might not have full range of motion yet, but we're going to continue with that. Um, as I said before, we're looking at not just the shoulder, right? So any good shoulder therapy looks at the range of motion of the neck, the spine, especially the upper part up in here. Uh, we want to make sure that's moving well, that your core is strong, um, and that you get to that point where you progress to the final rehab phase, which is getting you back to higher level activities that you want to do, like progressive strengthening so that um, you have enough power and control to, to hit that tennis racket or do that swimming, swimming stroke. Um, we're going to, uh, let's, let's say you are a tennis player and you're up here a lot. So this is a great picture. I like this because the guys, the person's holding the, the medicine ball. It's a heavy medicine ball. They have to make sure everything's in place and they might do some proprioceptive drill. That's like understanding where your joint is in space. Um, just some higher level activities to get you ready for return to your sport and your normal activities. Yeah. And that's all Megan put. <laughs> I was going fast because I felt like I didn't have enough time. Apparently, I have plenty of time. Um, does anyone have any questions for me specifically? As far as yes. So, can you skip going to your doctor and just make an appointment with the physical therapy? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> in our practice act, in most states, yes. Your insurance company will probably say no. Does that make sense? Medicare and those stuff. Yeah, do. yeah, they want to see that. Uh, and that's a good thing. You know, we want your your primary care physician in our healthcare model, right? They're supposed to be the gatekeeper of, of your healthcare um, because there are other things that can cause shoulder pain too that could be really not related at all to the mechanics of the shoulder, but cancers and different things. So it's good to see your PCP and let them know what's going on anyway. But yeah, uh, we do have a program here where if, you, if you're a member and you've got something going on, you just want like a quick, hey, can you check this out? That does exist here. Um, uh, if, you know, we, if, if you come down and we have no therapist available, we can't do it right then, but we'll at least tell you, uh, you know, come back at this day and this time and we'll do a quick little screening, if you will. And then if we feel like you might need the therapy or, or, or something uh, further, then you go to your, your, your doctor, get the order, Send you in. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, really just pain relief, mostly with what I'm talking about here. If a person comes in, and as Dr. Fleck has said, some people come in and they're just in a 
crazy amount of pain. Some people don't have very much. Sometimes people are in so much pain that we, we're not, we can't really get very far. Um, and we might do a little e -stim, a little electrical stimulation on that area. And really all it does is provides the person a little sensation um, so that they're not noticing the pain as much. Does that make sense? It's not going to cure the shoulder, but it might just help them deal with the, the, the pain of it. Um, just in that moment? Um, I, I have patients tell me, you know, particularly if someone's having a lot of pain, you know, the, at the end of their session, I'm gonna put some, some put the e on them with some ice, you know, and they'll say, oh, it felt really good for a few hours. Not, not the cure, but it might just help them get through the rehab and get through the, the trauma. So if you have a highly repetitive situation, yeah. like if I'm swimming 2,000, 3,000 yards, and I'm doing that motion um, 1,100 times with each shoulder, uh, if I start off and I'm having a pain, let's say in recovery mm -hmm. of that arm, uh, then as I'm swimming, it starts to dissipate, you know, less and less, and, yeah. and then it seems, seems to be fine. How come? You're saying is it, it hurts in the, the first it, few strokes? It, yeah, and yeah, well, the first, you know, 30 yeah, you know, and laps, then it, and then all of a sudden, yeah. it starts to disappear, the pain. It could be that your shoulder's a little tight, and you're doing your strokes, and something's getting pinched, um, and then as you move along, it's just loosening up. Uh, so loosen up more. Okay. Yeah, that could be. Have you ever gone running and, and uh, had the first few steps be challenging? <laughs> yeah. I don't in, run. In, in the past. Yeah. Never. So, so <laughs> free, you know, that, that's a very common phenomenon. People, when they get started, it's like starting a car in cold weather. Uh, you sort of get that vroom, 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 and then it starts, and then it's fine. Yeah. You drive, and you don't have those issues as you're driving. And frequently, if you stop and then start the car again, it starts very easily because it's moved up. And so that's the same thing that happens to the human body. If you're, if you're cold, if your muscles are cold, if your blood flow is not um, primed to address the muscles that are being asked to do the job that you don't need to do, uh, then you can uh, experience initial pain and discomfort in those areas. And that's why we talk about warmness and stretching. But in fact, what do you think about um, stretching initially as opposed to like a gentle um, sort of cardiovascular warm up and then doing stretching. Thoughts on that, which is better? Personally? Yeah. Get a little warm up, get a little blood flow in that stretch. Right, exactly. So, so people frequently think that going out and, you know, they're going to go play a tennis match or go swimming or whatever it is, and they do a couple of these and do a couple of Achilles stretches and do a little this and a little that, and then they go to the court and they start hitting. And the reality is, is they, all they're doing is stretching cold tissues, ligaments, capsules, muscle fibers. And uh, the real smart thing to do would be to get on an exercise bike for 10 minutes. You know, it opens up the blood vessels. It brings blood circulation in the area that stimulates the tissues to start to do their job in the way they should. And then, and then you can stretch after that. Um, and so that can be a very helpful way of preventing injury also. What you just suggested, is that helping the shoulder though? I mean, I understand it's helping the core and your, your hamstrings and- Blood goes to your shoulder. Okay, even so, if you're so yeah. on a elliptical or whatever. Absolutely. Okay. So, so all, all areas of your body are helped by uh, that sort of gentle warmth. Uh, five, 10 minutes cardiovascular, you know, it, your heart rate increases, your peripheral blood vessels dilate. Uh, it's not a great time to eat because your, mu your muscles are getting more of the blood flow than your internal organs, but your lungs are oxygenating your blood to go out to your extremities where they do their job uh, for what you're trying to accomplish. And so that is uh, usually the best way for any musculoskeletal part of your body. Not your stomach. So don't do that. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I have intermittent shoulder pain. Play tennis. Some uh, goes to a few weeks. It hurts a lot. Yeah. And it doesn't hurt, even though nothing has changed. I'm still playing the same amount of tennis and doing the same exercise. 
Sure. Uh, that's the room. Is that common? Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone experienced intermittent pain that comes and then goes? And not really sure what they did or why. And just sort of they waited a little bit and sort of went away. Um, to, yes. Extreme. My back hurts right now. And, you know, standing. So, so there are things that lead to a sense of discomfort, pain. And, and these are warning signs, in, in a sense. Does that mean you have to run out and go and see an orthopedic specialist? Not necessarily. Um, it depends on the reproducibility of the problem, the duration of the problem. Is there an injury associated with it, or is it just uh, like you described? Well, it, it, it can be you, you go out, your first 10 minutes playing tennis, it hurts or, you know, for a few weeks. And then you, you might want to alter the way you do things, and those pains may improve. But it is a sign that your body is unhappy about something. But there are, why do some days you get a headache and other days you don't? You try and ascribe it to caffeine or stress or X or Y or Z. And sometimes it's, you can link the two. But sometimes you can't. You wake up with a headache, number one. So there are variations. It's a very complex process, pain, and it's very difficult to put your finger directly on the cause um, in those kinds of circumstances. You get bitten by a snake, you know why. <laughs> Sir? Can uh, the shoulder problems you described, can they cause neck pain as well? Yes, absolutely. So the neck and the shoulder are very, very interconnected. And so your arm, including your shoulder, is held onto your body by muscles that attach to your spine and chest. And so by having a shoulder problem, let's say that's the primary problem. You, as a method of trying to work around your primary problem, have to use secondary muscles that include your neck and parts of your neck and upper back in order to compensate for deficits that you might have in a shoulder. And so you absolutely can develop secondary problems in your neck. Um, you can even lead to things like disc herniation, myofascial trigger points, muscle spasms, scapular dyskinesis, any number of factors that are not the problem, but they are a result of the problem being left untreated. And the easiest analogy I would make for that is, um, imagine you have a flat tire and you drive on it. After a while, it will cause primary damage to that wheel, rubber up this, but then it'll start to damage the other wheels, the wear, in an irregular pattern. It may bend the axle. It may lead to downstream effects that were not the original problem and are in areas that are not in the original problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, my next question is, I don't know which one is the primary problem. Right, so, so uh, the, the comment that I made in, in my discussion was, if you have pain in your arm that radiates below the elbow through your forearm and into your hand and has any numbness or tingling components to it whatsoever, sometimes it's helpful if you have your neck evaluated first. Now, first step is to talk to your primary care doctor. You say, hey, this is what's going on. And they'll say, all right, let me examine you. We'll do a couple of tests here, we'll do this, we'll do that, we we'll do some history. And then based on that, they will send you, uh, if they feel it's appropriate, if they're, you know, some, some of them just say, oh, let's get an MRI. Neck, shoulder, back, everything. Um, that's not really a great approach, but that's what some people do. Uh, a good primary care doctor will say, look, I think you, I think it's your shoulder, or I think it's your neck. Here's what I recommend. Initial triage of the problem. Therapy, frequently a mainstay, a first line, non-operative intervention. Um, in a perfect world, surgeons don't see people with non-operative problems. Surgeons see people with problems that have been treated uh, non-operatively to the to their conclusion, and they have been unsuccessful in uh, ameliorating the problem. And that's when a surgeon serves the most important role. But what has happened over time is uh, that primary care doctors, primary care uh, first line responders to patients um, are so busy because of the way the healthcare system is. They're like, oh, your shoulder, see the shoulder guy. Oh, your hip, see the hip guy. Oh, you have a sniffle, see the ENT. Oh, you have a headache, see the neurologist. And so that sort of shotgun triage approach to patients uh, is not in their best interest, but it's a function of the way the U.S. healthcare system works in many cases. 
So I see lots of people who have non-surgical problems. Hey, doc, 